next Tuesday, February 18th, from like 4.30 to 10. We'll be competing, so all university games, what is it? It's a competition between all of the different schools at NYU. Stern's going to be competing this year as a single school, so undergrad, MBAs, PhDs, pretty much the entire school together. Um, games are, include basketball, volleyball, tug of war, stack cups, limbo, uh, air hockey, table tennis, and then we also have a competition for a banner, mascot, um, and general stern school pride. Um, so we're looking for people to join the team, participate, even show up. Um, there's an event on campus groups. If you're interested in participating, there's a form there with information as well as the different events. Um, and we'd love to see people come out, participate, cheer us on. For all of the MBA ones in here, which I think many of you are, um, there are block points. So for all participants, there's 25 points per participant. And also for people that attend, is 25 points per uh, person who's there to cheer the Stern team on. So um, if you have any questions, definitely reach out. But we'd love to see as many of you out there cheering us on. Uh, like I said, events on campus groups, all the information. So definitely love to see you guys out there. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to start for the first, maybe until week three, with two questions which you don't have to answer, but you really, it's really about nagging you to get started. How many people in this class are still not in a group? Still not? Keep your hands up because at the end of class, you might just want to gather together as a group. There are five of you right here. So. Now, might not be the most scientific way to create a group, but how many of you have not picked a company? And I'd like an honest answer. Okay. As I said, I'll keep asking this question, and I hope by next week there are no hands up. So pick a damn company and move on, okay? Don't sit there and say, hey, should I pick this, should I pick Just pick something. Just pick something and keep moving. As I said, you can come back and change it. And for those of you who did pick a company, I gave you an assignment which realistically assumed that none of you has actually done. Okay? Which is, I said, take a look at your company, take a look at the board of directors in your company and ask a very simple question, which is, does this board of directors do what it was supposed to do, which is protect the interests of shareholders, or is this a board of directors designed to carry out whatever the CEO wants? As I said, it's a judgment call, and to make the judgment call, you can look at who's on the board, you can look at news stories, you can look at scores, but ultimately, the decision, the judgment has to be yours. Now, for some of you, one of the problems you're going to run into, especially if you picked a company in an emerging market, Latin America, Asia, is when you, st in the US, it's actually, you know, you can find information on your board if you go to the SEC filings. There's, there's this filing called the DEF 14. You can look up conflicts of interest and you can see what's going on. So you can collect a lot of information. But let's say you picked an Indonesian company. The company tells you there are 11 people in the board, doesn't even tell you who they are. You have a really difficult time finding anything about board members you're probably going to email me saying, well, how do I make a corporate governance assessment when I cannot get information? And I'm going to say something that's going to sound weird, but I'll explain it. Sometimes the absence of information is more revealing than what you find. So I'll do a complete tangent. You guys ever read Sherlock Holmes? Sherlock Holmes has this sidekick called Watson, whose job it is to ask stupid questions, and then Sherlock makes him look even stupider. <laughs> so this is one of those Sherlock Holmes stories. Where is Sherlock Holmes story? There's usually a murder at the start, and over the course of the next 300 pages, Holmes solves the murder, usually by telling Watson how stupid he is. So the key clue in this particular, I don't know, the Hound of the Baskervilles, I, I think I always get the story wrong, is at the end, Sherlock says, I've solved the murder. And the key clue is that the dog did not bark. You say, what does that even mean? Well, the dog did not bark because the murderer was somebody known to the dog. Maybe you're in the same LinkedIn connections, whatever it was. You know. 
Same thing applies here. Sometimes the absence of information tells you that there is no corporate governance of this company. What does it tell you? That a company can get away telling you there are 11 people on the board tell you nothing about those directors and get away with it. That tells you where the power lies. So don't stretch yourself saying, oh, somebody else in my group has all this documentation I don't. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, the judgment is what matters. Does your company fit into a profile where you as a stockholder say, I have power in this company? Or is this the kind of company where you say, hey, managers are going to run amok? Because the reality is if stockholders don't have much power over managers, guess what managers do? They do what's in their best interest. Not because they're bad people, but because that's what human beings do. Self-interest is going to drive your decisions if you're not afraid of a backlash. And let's look at some of the manifestations of how the self-interest plays out. Usually you see this most often when your company is the target of a hostile acquisition. And if you're the manager of a target company in a hostile acquisition, you're faced with a challenge, right? If you're maximizing stockholder worth, which is your job, and somebody's offering you 40% more than the stock price, what's the, the, the right thing to do? Well, if they're offering 40% you know, more and it's way above what there's, you sell the company. The only thing is if it's a hostile acquisition, what's the subtext here for you as a management of the target firm? What happens after a hostile acquisition to the management of a target firm? You're going to lose your job. So really the question I'm asking is, do you want to do the right thing in corporate finance and maximize stockholder wealth, or do you want to lose your job? He says, I'll do the right thing. Maybe you will, but you know, that's a tough choice, and you know which way you're going to tilt. And here's how it plays out. You've heard of green mail? You know what green mail is? Just like black mail, it's just a lot more money and it's legal. So here's how it works. You're the manager of a target firm. A hostile acquirer has come along. Give the hostile acquirer a name. They've offered 40% more than the stock price. So here's what you do. You go to the hostile acquirer. And you offer to buy whatever shares. Remember, remember the reason hostile acquirers in the US have to announce their intentions is once you get to 5% of the shares in a company, the SEC requires you to reveal whether you're going to do an acquisition or just hold the 5%. So let's say it's Carl Icahn. Or let's make it Boone Pickens. But in the early 90s, Union Oil, which was a big oil company, was targeted by Boone Pickens. In the early, early 1980s, Oil companies were on autopilot. They were making money without even trying. Oil prices had gone up. Everybody was making profits. So if you were a manager of an oil company, you lived a cushy life. Basically, you didn't even have to show up to work. The oil price went up. Your profits went up. And you've been targeted by Carl Icahn for a hostile acquisition. And you're faced with this choice, which is, hey, he's offering way more than the stock price. Should we sell our shares or should we fight it? And not surprisingly, Union Oil's managers decided to fight the acquisition. And here's how they decided to do it. They went to Boone Pickens and said, you paid $100 million for 5%. We will pay you $200 million to sell the 5% back to us and go away. And to show you how legally it was structured, you had to sign an agreement called a standstill agreement saying you would not buy shares. Again, this is to stop what usually happens in blackmail, right? You pay and then you get blackmailed again. With green mail, you, you bring lawyers in, they create a document, you sign it. You say, what's wrong with this? Now, if this were a just world, I can see what you're doing. You're protecting your jobs as management. Where should you have come up with the 200 million? By selling your houses, your cars, liquidating your portfolios, right? That wasn't how Union Oil's managers came up with the 200 million. They took stockholder money and essentially said, we're going to use it to pay the... Think about it. How do you even explain this to stockholders? Let me try. Your stockholders in Union Oil, I've just done this. I come to say, I did it all for you. I took $200 million of your money and made this nasty, hostile acquire. I was offering you 40% more than the stock price go away. And you're saying, you did what? To do what? Let's be absolutely correct. Green mail exist, existed for one reason and one reason alone. 
protecting incumbent managers, and no amount of dancing around how terrible hostile acquisitions were could make that go away. Clearly, managerial interests were served, stockholder interests are not. Second, golden parachutes. Now, if you actually jumped out of a plane with a golden parachute, you know what had happened, right? Those gold is heavy. You're going to hit the ground faster than you would have without a parachute. But you know what a golden parachute is? This is again when you're targeting a hostile acquisition. What are you afraid of? You're afraid you lose your jobs, right? So here's what happens with golden parachutes. US managers of the target company run to your lawyers and say, could you put in a clause into my compensation contract? Remember, this is happening after the acquisition has shown up, where if we get taken over, I get paid 10 million, 15 million, 20 million. When Revlon was bought out in a hostile acquisition, the collective payouts to managers in the company worked out to $200 million. Essentially, again, you're collecting the 200 million. You're saying, why am I stockholder hurt? Why are your stockholder hurt? Because when the acquirer pays the 200 million to you for the golden parachute, guess what that acquirer does? He pays or she pays $200 million less to acquire your company. Again, clearly managerial interests dominating stockholder interests. Third, your poison pills. You know what? If you ever go to work in M&A, it's this very strange mix of medieval times and James Bond movies. <laughs> there are white knights with poison pills. You're saying, what? You know what a poison pill is, right? You're targeted again as a target company. You do not want to be taken over. What you do is you create something in your company that makes you unpalatable to the acquirer. In the old days when the FCC had these very strict rules on companies not owning more than one TV station in a media market, it used to be that if an entertainment company got targeted in a hostile acquisition, didn't want to be taken over, you know what they would do? They would go buy a TV station in a city where they knew the acquiring company had this premier station. Let's say it's New York. And then they'd go to the FCC and say, you can't allow this to go on because if you did, it would be illegal. I can give you other examples. Now, you know what a rights issue is in a company? rights issue, US companies are very reluctant to do it, but European companies do. And we'll talk later about why US companies don't do it. Here's how a rights issue works. Let's say I'm a publicly traded company, you're all shareholders in my company. I need $100 million of new capital, and I need it from equity. Now normally, what do you think? You think about issuing new shares and raising the $100 million, right? You know the problem with, that doing, with, uh, with doing that, right? It is going to be costly because you have to hire investment bankers and you've got to set a price. In a rights issue, I skip that. Here's what I do. I give each and one of you, every one of you, you're all shareholders in my company, a right to buy an additional share. But I give you the right to buy that additional share at half of the current stock price. Now part of you is saying, that's terrible. You're having the price. But every one of you gets that right. So basically you'll end up, nobody's hurt because everybody gets that, that right. And if you're sensible, you will exercise the right. In fact, you can even sell the right. You, so if you don't want to exercise the right, you, you can sell the right and get the extra, you know, whatever the difference is between the price and the rights price. So I can raise the 100 million. So that's a typical rights issue. So if your stock price is $10, I give you the right to buy an additional share at $5. That's a typical rights issue. Here's how a poison pill would work. It'll be a rights issue. But the rights issue, I give you the right to buy an additional share at $100. Stock price right now is 10. I give you the right to buy an additional share at 100. You're saying, why would I want to even use that as long as I run the company? But the minute there is a hostile acquisition, here's what happens. That price goes from $100 to $1. It's called a flip over rights plan. And essentially, the reasoning is very simple. If I continue to run the company, there's no hostile acquisition. The rights issue is completely useless. But if a Carl Icahn tries to take over the company or somebody tries to take over the company, you see the problem they're going to face? They think they're buying 51% of the shares. But the moment after they buy the 51%, there are thousands of shareholders others who say, look, I have a right to buy an additional share at a dollar. It is purely a device to keep hostile acquisitions away. If you're confused about these convoluted poison pills, I'll give you a much simpler way to, to think about them. Four kids, and they're all grown up now, but my, I have only one daughter. She's third in line to the throne. 
there is no throne, but now. <laughs> but when she was about uh, you know, five or six, I would take her and her two older brothers out to brunch. She'd go to the diner. I'd sit on one side of a cubicle. They'd all three sit on the other side. Nobody wants to sit with dad. My daughter would sit in the middle, and her two older brothers would sit on either side of her. They'd all order eggs with fries. The waitress would come and put the plates down. And the minute the plate was put in front of my daughter, she would spit all over her fries. Disgusting, right? <laughs> but if you've ever had two older siblings sitting on either side of you and a plate of fries in front of you, you know exactly where those fries are going. So she know, you know what she was doing. She was introducing a poison pill. <laughs> Why is it a poison pill? You spit on your fries. You're perfectly okay. It's your own spit. Nobody else will touch it. Think about that. The next time you see a story about a poison pill, think about spitting on your fries. You pretty much got it nailed. The only problem is the manager of the target company didn't pay with, for the fries. They spit on fries they didn't even pay for. But that's a poison pill. And finally, you have shark repellents. What are shark repellents? These are anti-takeover clauses. You, you know, every company has a corporate charter, which are the rules for running the company. Now, normally to take over a company, what percentage of the shares do you need to acquire? 51%. It's like a democracy. But you know, you're allowed to change the corporate charter. So you can go in and say, you need 80% of the shares to get effective control of the company. Or you can say, look, the board of directors, because one of the ways you exercise control is you get to 51% of the shares, and then you replace the entire board. So I could go to the corporate charter saying, only one third of the board of directors can be replaced every two years. It's a shark repellent. You're saying, why am I even sequencing? Shark repellents are slightly better than the first three, and here's why. You as shareholders don't get to vote on poison pills, but you get to vote on shark repellents. You're saying, why would I vote for an anti-takeover clause in the corporate charter? Because I'm a really good salesperson as a CEO. I tell you it's for you to protect you. I claim that I will use this to bargain for a better price for you. And for some strange reason, you actually believe me. You give me the power, and then guess what I do? I use it to protect myself. So if you look at every single one of these actions, what, is it, what do they share in common? The managerial interests are served, the shareholders are left holding the bag. But I'm going to give you one final example. And this is, I think, the most perverse example of managerial interests dominating shareholder interests. If you're a manager of a company and your objective is to impoverish your shareholders as quickly as possible, not a great objective, you know the easiest way to do it? Just do a big acquisition and overpay on it. Because when you overpay on an acquisition, guess who pays? Your shareholders do. You, you think, why would managers do it? Because they want to build empires, because they want to you know, get in the newspapers. It's, you know, when you look at big acquisitions, your first reaction is, what led you to do this? This morning, the Wall Street Journal, there's an article on Bayer, the German pharmaceutical company. Read it. A few years ago, Bayer did an acquisition. My first reaction when I read about the acquisition is, are you guys insane? You know who they bought, right? They bought Monsanto. And when you buy Monsanto, what do you buy? A heap of trouble and a whole host of lawsuits. Why? Because Roundup, which is a Monsanto product, has been used on lawns across the US for decades, and it's creating all kinds of consequences and you're seeing those lawsuits start to work their way through. You think, why would Werner Baumann, the CEO of Bear, want to push for an acquisition? Because he is insane. <laughs> there is no other explanation. He talked something about consolidating the animal food businesses, some, some weird, it, there's really no good rationale. But to give you at least a microcosm of how these things work, let's go back and look at acquisitions. Let's think about typical acquisition. There's an acquiring firm and there's a target firm, right? 
On the day an acquisition is announced, of course you see a Wall Street Journal article about the acquisition and all of the attention is on the target firm and about all the great things, the strategic connections that are going to be made, the synergy, all that stuff. And everybody pays attention to the target firm and guess what happens to the target firm stock price the day the acquisition is announced? It jumps. Next time you read the new story of an acquisition, don't look at the target company's stock price, look at the acquiring company's stock price. You know that half of all acquisitions, on the announcement of the acquisition, the acquiring company's stock price drops, and sometimes substantially. You're saying, so what? What are the stockholders in the acquiring company saying about the acquisition when the stock price drops on the acquisition? They think you've paid too much, right? And if you ask the managers of the acquiring company, you know what their defense would be, right? They would be saying, hey, look, stockholders don't see all the stuff we see. We've seen the projections. We've got all the numbers in front of us. They have far less information than we do. Listen to us. And at first sight, you're saying, you're right. You have more information than shareholders do. Therefore, shareholders must be making a mistake. But here's, I think, what should make you rethink that notion. We know that half of all mergers do not work. You know how we know? Because within five or 10 years of mergers, merge, uh, half of all mergers get reversed, which is a company saying, I bought XYZ company 10 years ago. It didn't work out. I'll sell it. We also know that those much talked about synergies never manifest themselves in about five out of six mergers. More value is destroyed through acquisitions than any other corporate action on the face of the earth. But of course, there's an entire ecosystem of people who will push you to do acquisitions. And I won't name the people, but you know who they are. Right? They're like drug dealers. <laughs> and I use that word deliberately. In fact, I do a session called Acquirers Anonymous, Seven Steps to Sobriety. Because acquisitions are an addiction. When a company starts growing through acquisitions, it can't take projects anymore. It's so much work taking 50 projects. You do one big acquisition. So I'm going to take you through a very old acquisition deal. But the reason I'm going to focus on it is what happens that you see happening over and over and over again. It was about 32 years ago. A company called Eastman Kodak now, of course, in the history books, more known for its name than anything it does. At that time, a very well-regarded company, a company, of course, that had made its reputation by making cameras and film, decides to target a company called Sterling Drugs, a pharmaceutical company. You think, why would a camera slash film company target a pharmaceutical company? Well, I, I don't know, but I, I'll give you my guess. In the late 80s, the camera film business was starting to slow down. But the businesses you wanted to be in for growth were pharmaceutical companies. They were just taking off. And I don't know whether this happened, but my guess is a consultant showed up with a matrix. <laughs> You've seen these matri matrices? Cash cow, star, dogs, pigs. It's like a, it's like a barnyard all over the place. <laughs> And if you're a cash cow, what should you do? You should buy a star. You can see this playing out, right? Eastman Kodak, you're a cash cow. There's a star. Go buy it. And then they filmed a they probably did some strategic story to back it up. So Eastman Kodak decides to target Sterling Drugs. Sterling Drugs was trading at about $40 per share at the time they targeted it. They got into a bidding war with a Swiss pharmaceutical company called Hoffman LaRoche. And the first rule in acquisitions is when you're in a bidding war, try to lose. Because you know what happens when you win a bidding war? You have what's called an auction, a winner's curse in an auction. You heard of a winner's curse in an auction? You go to an auction, you start bidding. And then you win the auction. You should always have mixed feelings about winning. You won. Congratulations. But think of why you won. Everybody else in the room thought you were paying too much. By definition. 
So they get into a bidding war, the price gets pushed up. At 72, Hoffman LaRoche drops out. Eastman Kodak didn't even seem to notice, they kept bidding. It's like <laughs> being on eBay, you're bidding against yourself, you're pushing the price up. And eventually at $89.50, which is roughly $5.2 billion, they won the bidding war. Next day when you open up the Wall Street Journal, what will say? Eastman Kodak wins bidding war. January 22nd, 1988 was the day they won the bidding war. On the day they won the bidding war, Eastman Kodak lost $2.2 billion in market value in one day. They probably wiped out 15 years of hard work taking projects in one day. And this might be pure coincidence, but the premium that Eastman Kodak paid for sterling drugs over and above the market price was about $2.1 billion. This sounds a lot like a zero-sum game, right? which is if there's no synergy and you pay a premium of 2.1 billion, guess where that comes out of? It comes out of your shareholders. Well, you think, what's the extra 100 million for? Probably invest in banking fees, consulting fees, etc. for all the advice you got on this incredibly well thought through action. Of course, right after the bidding, Eastman Kodak talked about, oh wait, there will be synergy, that's why we did it exactly what synergy there is by combining a camera company with a drug company, I don't know. Maybe they'll find a way to deliver your medication through your... It's, it's almost mind-boggling. But here's the giveaway. If you track this merger for the five years after the deal was done, there's the revenue of the combined firm, there's the operating income of the combined firm. If there's synergy, what should start to show up? There should be higher income at some time, right? Maybe a jump in revenues, neither is showing up. So five years later, there's all this, you know, this, so at the time of the merger, everybody said synergy, but five years later, there's an article in the New York Times that says, Eastman Kodak is thinking of selling off Sterling drugs. And of course, when that initially came out, Louis Matisse, chairman of Sterling Winthrop, which is the division that Eastman Kodak said, that's massive speculation which flies in the face of the facts is like, you know, never believe something until it's officially denied. Because that's exactly what, what happened. A few months later, Eastman Kodak sells sterling drugs for 1.7 billion. How much did they pay? 5.2 billion. Now, if you look at the collective amount they got out of it, they got maybe three, three and a half billion back. That was pretty damaging. But to me, this was the start of Eastman Kodak's fall from grace. Because Eastman Kodak went from being this company that was viewed as well-managed, well-run, takes great projects. Essentially, with this acquisition, it wiped out that reputation with one bad, big deal. I mean, for the last um, 15 years, you know, Apple has this huge cash balance. <laughs> When Apple has a huge cash balance, people feel the urge to advise it to do really stupid things. Like what? Like buy Greece, buy Tesla, buy... You know, basically, Apple with 200 billion can buy pretty much anything it wants. And I have to give, you know, credit to Apple for not falling into temptation. Because I'm sure they probably have moats and crocodiles to keep consultants and bankers out of one infinity loop, saying, don't come in. Okay? <laughs> because I'm terrified of how much damage you can do with a $200 billion acquisition. And one of the reasons Apple stock price has gone up is because they've chosen not to do stupid things. I mean, I, have a rule, I, you know, I tell people I have a rule in my investing, and they never believe me. I say, look, I invest in companies, but the minute one of my companies does a big acquisition, I'm out of here. Because I know what history tells me about what happens after big mergers. Is most of them don't work. Could you be the exception? Yes. But I'm not going to hang around hoping you'll be the exception, because that's never worked for me in investing. So people say, well, how do you explain these deals, Dad? There was actually a study, uh, no, I don't know, working paper, I don't think it ever got published, that looked at factors that explain the size of the premium paid on an acquisition. Why do some companies pay big premium? And you know what they found? That the biggest factor explaining how big a premium you paid on acquisitions, how many acquisitions you did, was the CEO's ego. 
He's saying, how did this study measure CEO ego? It's actually very clever. This was about 20 years ago. This is, uh, there used to be this database called LexisNexis. The days before Google, if you wanted to do research, you went to LexisNexis and you typed in an A. And it'll tell you all the press you know, uh, mentions of this name. So they took each CEO's name, they went to LexisNexis, they put the name in, and they looked at how many times the name was mentioned. They said the more times your name is mentioned, the bigger your ego. I know it's a loose proxy, but it actually, I think, cuts to the heart of how much ego drives acquisitions. In fact, the one common theme across serial acquiring companies, you know serial acquirers, these are companies, is they tend to be run by CEOs who are overconfident. They're the people you hated in high school. You know, once they, were struck, they acted like they owned the school, and guess what? They actually did. These are the people who rise to the ranks. They're so overconfident that they come across, you know, as people who can pull almost anything off. They rise up the ranks, they become CEOs. And what's the essence of overconfidence? You think you can succeed where everybody else has failed before. Hey, that's what drives acquisitions. But when you're trying to explain acquisitions, people go through contortions trying to come up with rational explanations. And most of the time is, there are none. This is managerial interest being served. So one of the things I would like you to do, and this again assumes you've picked a company and you moved on, is try to find who the shareholders in the company are. And it's not difficult to do around the world. In fact, there's, uh, no, I think there's a Bloomberg terminal in the MBA lounge still, is, that, is there one? And is there one down in the basement? There are a couple of Bloomberg terminals. Find one after you've picked your company. So don't just go in and explore because people are waiting behind you. And after you've found your company, if you type in HDS for your company, you get the list of the top 17 shareholders on page one. Don't go to page two, page three, page four, you don't need to. Take that page one, see who the top shareholders in the company are. And here's what you're trying to assess. Where does the power in my company lie? You know the old saying, power abhors a vacuum? Somebody's exercising power in the company. Who is it in your company? And here are the choices. It could be a very unusual company where shareholders actually call the shots. Very unusual. It could be a company where managers are clearly the dominant ones. It could be a company where inside shareholders are the ones who call them, and the rest of us are on the outside. Like, what, you do Facebook? I wouldn't even waste my time saying who runs this company. <laughs> because we know where the power lies. It lies with Mark Zuckerberg, and through what, and what is his instrument for, the, for exercising the power? Why does he have so much power? He owns only less than 15% of the shares, but because the shares have different voting rights, with that 15%, he controls 57% of the voting rights. That's why if you buy shares in Facebook, you know, and Facebook went public and there are two classes of shares, I told people, look, you know, if you buy Facebook, accept the fact, whether you like it or not, that Mark Zuckerberg runs a company. And if you're a portfolio manager, don't come and complain to me that Mark Zuckerberg is not listening to you. Because complaining about Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook is like getting married to Kim Kardashian and saying, hey, cameras keep following me all over the place. <laughs> you marry a reality TV star, that's exactly what you should expect. Any time you buy shares in a company with two classes of shares, you're saying, okay, I'm okay with that. It could be a company where the government runs a company, even though it's a publicly traded company. When will this be the case? Often with companies that used to be government companies that have now become publicly traded companies, the government might be the power behind the throne. You buy shares in Petrobras, guess what? What happens in Brasilia matters a lot more than what happens in the boardroom at Petrobras. And we'll again talk about the mechanisms governments have to exercise, because they definitely don't own 51% of the shares in the company. It could be a company sometimes where labor runs the company. In some parts of Europe, for instance, there are two or three directors on the board who come from the unions. It could also be a company, the bankers run the company, even though they're the people who lend money. Why? Because some covenant has been breached, and in this case, the bankers have appointed the people running the company. See, why are we wasting time on this? Shouldn't we be computing ratios and... Now, before you do the numbers, understanding where the power lies will let you understand why the company does what it does. 
I know it sounds abstract, so I'm going to take my companies and take you through the process of where does the power lie. Let me start with the first one, Disney. I'm going to take you all the way back to 2003, and I'll show you what the holdings have done since then. And in 2003, if you looked at the top 17 stockholders in Disney, this is what it looked like. Don't get too caught up in reading the names. Go to the third column. What does it say? 13F. You're saying, what the heck is a 13F? A 13F is a filing that an institutional investor in the U.S. has to make with the SEC when it owns shares in a company. So what are you getting there? 16 of the top 17 shareholders in Disney are big institutional investors. Fidelity, State Street, etc. Now remember, the question you're trying to answer is, if I'm a stockholder in Disney, how much power will I have? You know what that, this page gives me? It makes my stomach drop if I'm a Disney stockholder, because I know nobody's going to make my case. Fidelity is not black. You, you know why, right? Because if you have Fidelity, you really can't fight this fight in multiple companies. If you don't like the way Disney is run, what do most institutional investors do? They sell and they move on. And I don't blame them for doing it, but if you have a company that's predominantly held by institutional investors, you can start off with the premise that managers in this company probably have the upper hand because those institutional investors will not stand their ground. You think there's one person on the list. It's Roy Disney. You know how he got the shares. He inherited them. And he owns a tiny percentage, 0.66%. So in 2003, if you ask me, where does the power lie in Disney? It's no contest. It's going to lie predominantly the managers because there's nobody on this list that's going to terrify managers. Let's move on. Vale. Vale is a Brazilian mining company. But to give you some history, Vale used to be an entirely government-owned company the 80s, 90s, until it went public. The government took it public for a simple reason. Why do governments take prior, you know, government-owned companies and make them public? They need the money. Now, there's nothing more glorious than that. No, like the Indian government is trying to sell Air India. The only problem is they'll probably have to pay somebody to take the company rather than the other way around. But you're selling companies because you want the money. So that's why Bali went public. But the government wasn't willing to let go of control. And this is the problem with government-owned companies going public. The government wants the money, but it also wants to run the company. In the case of Vale, here's how they created that control. First, they had two classes of shares. And if you buy shares in Vale, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to get shares which are called preferred shares, an Orwellian turn of phrase. Because one of these class of shares has voting rights and the other doesn't. Guess what, which one doesn't have the voting rights? It's a, you're a preferred shareholder. Why? You don't get to vote. You, do you, you know, grapple with that in your head? But if you are trading on Vale, you're going to end up with the, the non-voting shares. And here's how we know that. The voting shares are held by seven entities, one of which is the Brazilian national you know, the fund. Basically, the government exercises power through the voting rights. And the other six entities are all connected to the government. But here's the other institution that the government created. It has what's called a golden share. You know what a golden share is? A golden share gives you veto power. Over what? If Vale wants to do an investment, a big investment in another country, a mine, the government, if it doesn't want it to happen, can say, no, you can't do that. So in this company, if you get Vale, you can look at the top 17 shareholders, but they're going to be in the non-voting shares. But then if you dig a little deeper, you'll find very quickly that when you look at the board of directors, they're pretty much chosen by the government to make sure that whatever's in the government interest gets carried out. A few years ago, I wrote a post on Petrobras. I'll send you the link. Petrobras rose in market cap to become the largest market cap company in all of Latin America, 200 billion. And in the space of a couple of years, it took the 200 billion, made it 20 billion. This is a really tough challenge to pull off. To me. So I essentially looked at how do you destroy value? So in fact, I gave corporate, you know how in corporate finance we give examples of companies that do things right? Petrobras should be an example of how 
you do everything wrong. So basically investment finance. So you, if you took every financing principle and turned it, on, turned it on and said Petrobras was doing it. And then people started thinking, well, how, why? Why would they do it? It turned out that Pet Petrobras in the last decade was given a mission by the government. And remember, the government pulls the strings. You know what they were told? Become the largest oil company in the world. And they carried that out. They went looking for oil everywhere. Under your house, they dig up your house, there's oil there. And often they were exploring for oil in places you should be in terms of, the, it didn't make sense in terms of the cost, but they did it anyway because they had a mission. Go to the minister and say, we found more oil. And in the process, they destroy. If you start with the wrong mission, everything you do is going to be driven by the mission. So if you have one of those companies where the government is behind pulling strings, I'm not saying it's going to be good or bad, but that is going to explain why the company does what it is more than any other assessment you do of the numbers. take Tata Motors. I looked at the top 17 shareholders and I noticed a strange thing. I saw the name Tata pop up again and again. Of the top 17 stockholders in Tata Motors, six are Tata entities. And this is a feature, not a bug, of family group companies. It reflects a history. You know why it reflects a history, right? Why did Tata Steel become a large stockholder in Tata Motors? It's not because they went and bought shares in Tata Motors, but 40 years ago when Tata Motors needed to build a plant, if Tata Steel, remember they were both privately owned companies then, or family owned companies, the family would take money out of Tata Steel, put it into Tata Motors to build a new plant, and put the accounting for, hey, you now own shares. In. So now you see the results. But it has a corporate governance consequence. Each of these companies is owned by the family group. So if you're thinking about Tata Motors, be, in fact, you know, they all are in one headquarters building in, uh, in Mumbai called Mumbai House. So each floor is for a different Tata company. And the top, top floor, it used to be Ratan Tata, the family patriarch. So if you're Tata Motors and you're thinking about making an investment, the question you've got to ask is, is this investment going to be in the best interest of Tata Motors, or am I going to take care of the family group. And when you have a stacked corporate governance system where the family can exercise control, guess whose interests are going to win out? So as we go through the semester, there are things that Tata Motors is going to do where you're going to say, that doesn't make sense if you look at it as a standalone company. But if you think about it as part of a family group, it's going to start to make sense. For instance, they borrow more than they should. Tata Steel borrows more than it should. Tata Chemicals borrows more than it should. Each company by itself, you're borrowing too much. But Tata Consulting Services, which is the largest part of Tata, the Tata Group by far, borrows no money. You see, so what? It's almost like Tata Motors, Tata Steel, and Tata Chemicals are being lent money by banks. Why? Because they're part of a family group. And the bank says, the family group will never let this company go down. So we're going to lend them more money. So when you look at family group companies, don't be surprised to see them do things that don't make sense as standalone companies, but are in the best interest of the group. Let's look at Baidu. Baidu, you, do you know what Baidu does, right? The only people who've heard of Baidu are people who live in China, and here's why. If any of you land in Shanghai or Beijing, you might not want to do it in the next couple of weeks. Hold off on that. I remember the first time I landed in Shanghai. I was writing a blog post, very you know, 21st century on my. I land and I go to my blog to check you know, the post. And it says, your blog is not found. So I said, this is weird. Let me type Google. Google's not found. I said, what the heck happened? Trillion dollar company disappeared in the 20 hours while I was in the air. <laughs> it turns out in China you need some VPN or some, something to get around to get to Google. That Baidu exists because Google doesn't in China. It's a search engine. It makes money the way Google does through advertising. So if it's a Chinese search engine, that I don't think I, mean, I, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody outside China who says I use Baidu over, all the time. You'd expect it to be trade, listed and traded in China, right? So when it got listed as a publicly traded company, guess where it got listed? 
it got listed on the NASDAQ. You're saying, well, that's where the, the most capital is, that's where they went there. There's a little problem, though. Now, Baidu falls into this category of companies that the Chinese government views as in being in sensitive businesses. You're not supposed to open your shareholding to non-Chinese investors. So here's how Baidu got around this divide. It listed in, on the NASDAQ, but it didn't list the Chinese company. It listed a shell company in the Cayman Islands. What does the shell company own? Nothing. I don't even know whether there's a shell. Maybe they can find Cayman Islands. You should be able to find a shell. Put the shell, call it Baidu. That's how you got a shell company. You buy shares in the shell company. And the shell company has an operating agreement with the Chinese company. That technically means the earnings are supposed to come. But that operating agreement is actually potentially illegal because the Chinese government tomorrow could get up and say, hey, you know what? That operating agreement doesn't hold. You buy shares in Baidu, you're buying shares in a shell company. You know the board of directors you control? The board of directors run the shell company, and they're running a shell. You have absolutely no power over the management of the company because it's a separate company. You want to see a higher profile version of Baidu? Which one? So who's an even bigger version of Baidu that does exactly the same thing? Alibaba. Alibaba is exactly the same structure. You buy shares in Alibaba, you're not buying shares in Alibaba, the Chinese company. You're buying shares in Alibaba, the shell company. And if you have any delusions that Jack Ma will listen to you, let him go. Again, I'm not saying this is good or bad. You just have to be real about what you're investing in. There is no corporate governance at Alibaba. It's essentially what Jack Ma wants. And so essentially, it's run by a group of people that could be called a board. It could be called a pro, you know, whatever you want to call it. You know. But essentially, you and I don't have any power as shareholders in the company. And guess what? It's going to drive. When you look at Baidu, as we go through this class, you're going to see this play out in their decision making. Let me go back to Disney. I showed you the 2003 top 17. This is the 2009 top 17 list. Notice one big change. Who's on top of the list? Steve. How the heck did Steve Jobs become the largest shareholder in, in Disney? Because he owned 60% of Pixar. And when Disney acquired Pixar, they paid with shares. And overnight, Steve Jobs became the largest shareholder in Disney. Again, remember, the question we're asking is, as a shareholder in this company, is anybody going to be making my case? I feel a little more hopeful in 2009. You know why? Because the big challenge that entertainment companies face today is being stuck in the status quo. And Disney, more than any other entertainment company, is going to be tempted to live in the past, right? Because it's such a glorious past. But the world is shifting. And if there are words you could have used to describe Steve Jobs, it wasn't get along and go along kind of guy. <laughs> so if you were Disney and you got up there and said, we're going to keep re-releasing Snow White every Christmas. Remember, for 50 years, Snow White was not available on video. Every Christmas, they would re-release it in the movie theaters and collect it. If you got up in 2009 and said that Steve Jobs would slap you around the face saying, are you guys crazy? We live in a world where people can stream stuff. They're going to pirate the thing. So I'm not saying Steve Jobs is thinking about me as a shareholder in Disney. In fact, he, oh no, I don't even exist on the radar. But it's good to know that there's somebody here fighting your fight. And that's something I want you to remember. Sometimes when you look at the top 17 list, you're going to find a name saying, I'm glad that person is there. You probably heard that the Elliott Group, which is this private equity group, has acquired a stake in SoftBank. This is going to be fun to watch. <laughs> I'm getting my popcorn ready, because SoftBank is run by a megalomaniac called Masasan. And when megalomaniacs do the right things, everybody bows and scrapes into Masasan. He's such a visionary. He's got 300-year plans. It's a height of hubris to make 300-year plans. 
But in the start of last year, everybody says, Master Son, such a great investor, he's got such vision. And now, of course, the whole thing has shifted because of the WeWork fiasco. People are saying, does he even know what he's doing? So when you see Elliot on that list of top 17, and you're a soft, you know, it's SoftBank trades at about 60% of book value right now. Book value is actually holding some other companies. It's actually saying, this is like a closed and mutual fund trading at a 40% discount. And you know why? Because the money in SoftBank is controlled by Master Son. And what are you bringing in? Hey, this guy can screw up big time. He could screw up this book value by investing in something else. And that's the basis for the Elliott Group. So when you look at your top shareholders and you see a Carl Icahn or a Bill Ackman here, and instantly you won't see their names because they each have their own, you know, their own holding groups that do it. And I'll send you the list of names. If you see one of those names, you should be happy as a stock on the company, not again because you like. Let's face it, I, you don't want to hang out with Carl Icahn. You don't want to have dinner with Carl Icahn. He'll probably eat you. <laughs> hey? And the one common feature across these, these activist investors, as they're called, is they're unpleasant people. They have to be. Why? Because what do they do? They get in manager's face and say, you are a terrible manager. Polite people don't do stuff like that. But we have polite people. If companies continue to be run by bad managers, so when you see an activist investor on that list, now I'll send you a list of the top 100, you should be, as, a, as, a, as somebody looking at the company, saying, at least stockholders of somebody here who's making their case. It doesn't mean the case they make is always the right one, but you get a pushback. Remember we talked about the devil's advocate? This is your devil's advocate. Okay. When you see activist investors, that should make you happy. And in fact, you know, I know activist investors have acquired a bad name. There are people who view them as you know, bad people. They're probably not nice people, as I said. And then they want to take the next step. We want to ban activist investing. I describe activist investors as market laxatives, which is they make the system work. You take activist investors out of the system, what do you have? You have constipated markets, and Europe is full of them where essentially things get stuck in companies and there's nothing you can do. So again, you're looking for some hope because you and I have absolutely no hope of being listened to. Maybe you're much wealthier than I. But there's nothing I can do at Apple to make them listen to me because what am I going to buy, 10,000 shares? That's going to take up my entire wealth. 15,000 shares. You need people with big holdings who can be heard. And that's what you're looking for on that list, is there somebody here who can push back if managers do stupid things. So if, any, if some of you are doing healthcare, I would strongly recommend picking Bayer as one of your companies. This company has lost half its market value since the Monsanto acquisition. Half of its market value. It's lost $100 billion in market value. And here's the scary thing. The same guy who screwed up and caused this problem is still running the company. That tells you a lot about corporate governance at Bear. Take a look at the top 17 stockholders. How come you don't have an activist investor in this group making noise? Because otherwise, how are you going to get change in companies where managers are entrenched? So that's the first leg. Stockholders have power over managers. The reality is, in most companies, stockholders have little or no power over managers. Managers put their interests first. Let's move to the second linkage. Remember the assumption we made? Lenders lend money to a company, and what do they do? They don't protect themselves, saying, oh, there's a reputation effect. They were not. In the real world, if you lend money to somebody and you don't protect yourself, it's not a question of whether you're going to get taken to the cleaners. It's when. Okay? Let's see why. Let's play a game. Let's suppose you're a bank, and we're all equity investors in a company, and we're coming to borrow from you. So when we come to go to borrow from them, how should we describe the projects we're going to take? Risky or safe? Oh, well, it's very safe projects. We're going to look after this money as if it were wrong. And let's say you're a trusting banker, which is an oxymoron. Because you know what happens to trusting bankers. They don't stay bankers for long. You say, you guys look honest. 
here's 10 billion dollars. So now we have 10 billion dollars we borrowed from the bank. We told them we were going to take safe projects, but there's no, they didn't write it in. There are no covenants restrictions. Now that we have the 10 billion, might our incentives be different? What are some of the things we could do? We could do a dividend. Let's pay ourselves a dividend. We could buy back stock. You think that's unethical? It might be, but it's still legal because they didn't restrict me. I could take a risky project. I told them I was going to take a safe project, but I could take a risky project called risk shifting. Or I could go borrow even more money using whatever I used as collateral the first time around, saying, you know, which makes your loans riskier. Now, do you see why I don't stay a trusting banker for long? So when you lend money, what do you do? You write covenants. You can't do this. You can't do this. But you can see that this is a friction that's going to play out all through time. Because when you borrow money, you've created a group with very different interests in the shareholders. What do bankers want? They want safety. In fact, they want you to borrow the money, leave it in cash. Why? Because then you pay them back. If bankers ran the company and played this game, what would they do differently? They would take no risk. They would invest their money in things safe. They would never pay a dividend. Remember, when you pay a dividend, cash leaves the company. And that friction is going to play out. And if you don't protect yourself, the stockholders are going to take advantage of lenders. You know, the pushback you get is, what if I'm lending to a really reputable company with a long history? It's been around. They wouldn't do stuff like this, right? And I tell them about RJR Nabisco. Right, let's play a game. Let's suppose in the mid-80s, you've just retired. And you moved to Florida. Why? You pay no taxes. And it's warmer most of the time. And you live next to a golf course. And I'm your broker. So you kind of get the setting. So you come to me. You have a half a million dollars in savings you accumulated. And you tell me you want to invest that money. I suggest a mutual fund, but you say, no, 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 I'm retired. I can't take that risk. I suggest some nice T-bonds. Initially, you're interested, but then I tell you what rate you will make. That's too low. I can't pay my golf dues. I suggest a corporate bond. Initially, you resist saying, hey, companies can default, right? I say, no, no, this is a really safe company. It's a company you probably heard of, RJR Nabisco. So I've seen their name all over the, you know, the grocery store. They've been around 70 years. And to give you comfort, I say, and they're rated AA. You have no idea what that even means. And I tell you, I tell you that no AA rated company has ever defaulted while it was rated AA. I'm a very careful broker. This is technically <laughs> true. So you listen to me. You take your half a million dollars, you put it in a bisco, and you go back to the golf course. Two years later, you open up the newspaper. And you spit out your coffee because it says RJR acquired by KKR in LBO. You have no idea what these acronyms even stand for. So you call me, so what the heck happened? You say, nothing, don't panic. There's this outfit called KKR that has come from New York. They've done a leverage buy. You're saying, what the heck is a leverage buy? They borrowed a ton of money and acquired the company. But your bonds are still there. You've still got the same coupon. But remember that double A that I talked about a few years ago? They're still in the alphabet, <laughs> but they've slid a little. It's double B. You're saying, what the heck does that mean? Well, that coupon you have on your bond, you might not be paid that coupon anymore. So you know what happens when you have a bond? The coupon is set, and overnight it becomes riskier. What's the only mechanism markets have for adjusting? The price of the bond, that's the day of the LBO. So on the same day that equity investors are celebrating, your 500,000 just became 400,000. You've just been Nabisco'd. <laughs> Let's introduce that into the corporate finance lexicon. You lend money to a company, you don't protect yourself, you are going to get Nabisco'd. And that's something you're going to see play out when we talk about should you borrow money and how much should you borrow because Lenders learned after being Nabisco that they couldn't lend to even reputable companies and not put restrictions on them. So you lend money to a company, you don't protect it. So in the real world, you, you are going to get ripped off, and that's a friction. Let's move on to firms and financial markets. Do you remember what we assumed? What do firms do? They tell the truth and on time. So bad things happen to you, run to markets, and you say, guys, terrible things have happened to us, and we want to let you know right away. In what universe does that happen? 
In the real world, there are problems with this assumption. Because if you lived in a world where managers told the truth and markets were efficient, here's what should happen. You're a company, you go out and take good long-term projects. And I'll leave the word good kind of in quotes right now. What should happen? Your stock price should go up. You're a company that goes out and does short-term accounting gimmicks. Market shouldn't you know, rise to push up your stock price. And also, if you're a company where markets are efficient, your stock price performance should be a good measure of how much value you're creating. So Tesla must have created a lot of value in the last six weeks. Look at how much its stock price has gone up. So if you lived in a world where managers now lie and markets are efficient, the assumptions go through. But both sides of that, of that linkage, things can go wrong. Let's start first with managers. Do they lie? Well, most companies, I don't think they lie. They shade the truth. We'll talk about shading the truth. You're not lying, but you're kind of holding back. If you have kids, you know what shading the truth is. They tell you things, but it's the things they don't tell you that should scare you than the things they do tell you. They're shading the truth. It is true that in some cases, they cross the line. I'll give you examples of outright fraud. A company called Briex, it's a Canadian gold mining company. In the 80s and the 90s, it went out and claimed to find gold in Indonesia beyond any reserves ever found. Stock price keeps going up and up. In fact, I remember equity research analysts writing about Briex saying, Hey, they, you know, we actually, they actually flew us out to Indonesia, showed us this place. And you know what the company did? They actually put gold dust on the sun, and the analysts came and said, look, there's so much gold under the ground, it's coming out. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, you're a gold analyst in New York. It's not like you've ever been in a gold mine. You think it comes in bars and coins, and you come back and write this great equity research report. Stock price keeps going up until in 95 or 96, the geologist who worked for the company, who was the key person finding the money, jumps out of a plane at 32,000 feet without a parachute. And nothing good happens when you do that. And when he does, people start asking, well, listen, why did he do it? Was he depressed? He Maybe he was, but it turns out in the months after, the company starts putting out news stories saying, those 100 million ounces of gold we said we had, well, take the last zero off. It's really only 10. Then it became one, and finally they said there's no gold. The entire thing was a scam. They pulled off for an entire decade. Publicly traded company. That is outright fraud. Here's a second example. A company called Mercury Finance. Late 90s. Its business model was lending to people with bad credit histories and charging a high... It's, just not, it's not a terrible business model. It could work. So I opened up the Wall Street Journal. There's a new story about Mercury Finance. And here's what it says. Mercury Finance announces that they cannot find their CFO. <laughs> this is how the news story starts. They've looked everywhere. You know, this is before online. They couldn't even check online. CFO has disappeared. And then at the end, in the last paragraph, it says, so is half our cash balance. <laughs> Somebody's having a lot of fun somewhere. And it's not you and I shareholders. That is outright fraud. But thank God it's more the exception than the rule. Because I think most companies don't have to commit outright fraud. They just shade the truth. They control the flow of information. Let's face it, if you're a manager of a company, you want to reveal information when it's right for you. And it's human nature, right? How many of you are married? Let's suppose you have something terrible happen today. Don't worry, I'm not forecasting anything terrible happening. <laughs> no, but you, but I'm not getting home at 6 o'clock. Huh, I have some bad news. If you have, in fact, if you have some bad news, what do you do? You try one of two strategies. One is you go, wait for a good time. Not now, not now, window of opportunity open, closed. Maybe when she's sleeping, I'll whisper it to her. <laughs> and I said, look, I told you last night. You were sleeping, I didn't know. So one is you wait for a good time. Or second, you try to bundle the bad news with some good news. You get desperate for any type of good news. This morning when I was driving to the train station, I wrapped the car around a tree. Oh, but I switched to Geico. <laughs> Completely disproportionate. Companies do something similar, right? One is they try to dole out bad news when the market is sleeping. You think, when is that? 
a few, a tw long time ago, when I actually used to do research, and I kind of gave up on that a long time ago because was, you know, I wasn't very good at it, you know, no point doing it. One of the things I did, when you do research, especially academic research, you pick these small topics that nobody cares about, then you slice them up even further and make them even less careable about, and then you write about them and nobody reads it. So this is one of those papers I wrote when I had to write a paper where I looked at earnings reports and dividend reports re from companies. So remember, US companies report earnings and dividends. I looked at them by day of the week. You can see how deep the thought is that went into the study. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I looked at what a typical earnings report contained as news and what a typical dividend report contained. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, during this period, thousands of earnings reports generally contained good news. Friday's terrible things seem to happen to companies. And then I took a closer look at Friday, and during the course of Friday, it looked very much like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but you hit 4 o'clock. Really bad things seem to happen at 401, 402, 403, 404. You know, J.P. Morgan reported about that whale incident. You have no idea what I'm talking about, right? This has nothing to do with food or sushi. This is in London, they had this multi-billion dollar mishap. Let's call it that. You know when they revealed it? 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. What are they hoping for? That you'll forget about it by the time you come back on Monday. It never happens. You know how this plays out, right? Over the last 80 years, the worst day of the week to invest in stocks has been Monday. You're saying, but shouldn't we be rational and start marking down prices? No, people wait till Monday and say, okay, you lost six billion in London, we're gonna knock off your stock price. So do managers try to control the flow of information? Yes. Do they try to bundle some good news with bad news? Yes. I remember in 2009 and 2010 when banks would report earnings, here's how the earnings report would go. We lost three billion, but we're not Lehman. We say, hey, we haven't gone bankrupt yet, this is really good news. Now it plays out where you know, we're down 20%, but we're up in the Ivory Coast by 50%. The fact that you went from a dollar to two dollars, you don't mention that, you talk in percentage terms. <laughs> Companies do this when you have really bad news, you try to bundle it, and I don't blame them. And markets on the other side are not exactly angelic in the way they respond to news. They're not exactly rational and cool. Remember that trading room I described in the utopian world, what was it full of? Polite intellectuals, let's get real. Polite and intellectual would be the two words I would not use to describe a trading room. Have you ever seen a trading room in action when a piece of news hits the market? What do traders do? Buy, sell, do something, we'll talk about it later. They act first and they react later. It's, it's you know, when you look at markets, they clearly are not rational and cool. And in fact, this gets us into trouble in finance because we make that assumption of rational markets and we draw all kinds of neat stuff out of it. And whenever I see one of these attempts to push, put, push rationality way beyond its bounds, I apply what's called the Elvis Presley test. You never heard of the Elvis Presley test? No. How many of you believe Elvis is still alive? Okay, you've all passed the test. Thank God for small blessings. Time has a way of taking care of it. In 1991, there were a fair number still there. Isaac, he lives in Michigan, he's grown a beard, his next CD is coming, record is coming out in two years. He's been dead a long time. 1977, late 70s. So let me do the second test. You can relax it because it's, the second test is not going to be directed at you. You read USA Today? The newspaper. It's like a McDonald's version of a newspaper, which is if you want to read the news in five minutes, USA Today, you can pretty much read the whole paper in five minutes. And every day on the, in USA Today, they run a poll. And if it's not an election year, it's really difficult to find a question to keep asking, you know, 250 days. So they start asking really dumb questions like, do you like lettuce on your burger? 69% of Americans said yes. 23% said no. And seven or eight percent say, I don't know. No matter what the poll is. Have you noticed this? People, Americans were asked, what's your name? 93% of Americans said, I know. 7% I don't know. This incredibly paranoid fringe wandering and said, don't ask me any questions. I can't answer them. 
So this was in 1992 on the 15th anniversary of Elvis's death. So here's a question. Do you think Elvis is still alive? 71% of Americans say no, thank God for small blessings. 22% of Americans say yes, he's still alive. I read about it in my news source, probably the National Enquirer, <laughs> last week. And 7% of course said, I don't know. Let's say, take that 7% and set them aside as paranoid and rational. Remember, the two are not mutually exclusive. Maybe they're the ones who got this right. And let's take the 22% of Americans, 15 years after Elvis' death, who thought he was still alive. Let's extrapolate. There are 300 million Americans, 22% is about 66 million Americans wandering around thinking Elvis is still alive. And we try to create all these elaborate stories for why people do what they do. I mean, last week I got these emails saying, how do you explain Tesla going from you know, 600 to 1,000 in two days, two trading days, they went from 600. And I said, do you know 66 million people wander around thinking Elvis is still alive? <laughs> and some of them have a lot of money. They, sometimes we try to explain things that are, why, how do you explain Bitcoin? 66 million people wandering around thinking, and you can, you can extrapolate this to the globe. Let's put it this way, there are a lot of people out there who do things on impulse for reasons that we can't even explain. And here we are trying to put rational explanations on things. Keep this in mind because later in this class we're going to talk about if you do this, this is what should happen to your value. You go out and you buy back shares given the, the numbers. But when I say this to man, he say, if I do this, will my stock price go up? I say, I don't know what your stock price will do because there are 66 million people. It's amazing what the 66 million will do for you in terms of providing a buffer between you trying to explain too much of the stock price. And in the last 40 years in finance, there's an area of finance called behavioral finance, a combination of psychology and finance that has done a really good job of explaining why prices can do the things they do. And they have nothing to do with value. So here are some of the irrationalities that have been uncovered. One is, there is some evidence that markets don't react right to news. They sometimes overreact. They some, in fact, with every one of these irrationalities, the problem is it's not one direction. There is evidence on both sides. They sometimes overreact. They sometimes underreact. There are some markets where insiders run the market. People think of it as almost a conspiracy. And third, the biggest hit against markets, against financial markets, is their short term. This has become the basis for, hey, you can't trust stock prices, investors are short term. So let's deal with that question frontally, because if investors are short term, we are on dangerous ground even looking at the market price. We have no idea what it tells us, right? So I'm going to ask you for your priors on markets, and you don't have to tell me what your answer is. Tell me what your gut tells you right now, based on what you've learned about markets, what you've seen in markets. If I ask you, say, focusing on market prices will lead companies to make short-term decisions at the, end, at, at the expense of long-term value. What's your, what's your belief right now? Just pick that, and then I will present some evidence. Maybe it'll change your belief or not, but that's going to drive how much you trust or mistrust prices. Either, second, allowing managers to make decisions without having to worry about the effect on market prices will lead to better long-term decisions. It kind of looks like the same as the first question, but it's a different one, right? Because markets can be short-term, but here you're saying, I trust managers to be long-term. And third, maybe neither managers nor markets are trustworthy. Maybe you need an external entity, a government, a regulator, kind of driving decisions at companies so they're long-term decisions. Okay? It's almost a philosophical question because how you answer this question will color everything you do in looking at businesses, the way you regulate them, the way you think about stock prices. So as I said, I'm not expecting an answer that, conf that conforms with what I think. It's something that I want you to be clear about because as we go through this class, you're going to be wrestling with this under the surface because it's going to be driving how much do I trust the numbers. So let me give you at least start, I mean, I, when people say markets are short term, it's an easy thing to say, because all you have to do is say, look at what happened to Tesla over two days. So let, but let me step back and give you some counter evidence against market short termism. Casper is going public, right? 
even with the markdown, probably I have 600 million as a market cap yesterday. How much did the company make last year? It lost money, it has very little revenues, and the market is attaching a $600 million market cap. If markets were short term, they were focused on what will the earnings be next year, how do you explain all these young companies able to command multi-billion dollar valuations? I know it's very loose evidence against short termism, but if markets were truly short term, companies which have earnings today should be valued more than companies with earnings way out in the future. A Volkswagen should have a much, 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 much higher market cap than a Tesla should. And if you look at investment announcements companies make about new products, about R&D, if you lived in a short-term market, remember when you announce you're going to spend a lot of money on R&D, that's bad news for me, right? Why? Because what does R&D come out of? It comes out of earnings. You have lower earnings. And if I'm a truly short-term investor, I should punish companies that announce they're going to do R&D. So I'm going to present you some evidence on what markets do around announcements. So basically, I have a bunch of announcements R&D. And guess what? On average, markets react positively to almost every announcement except product strategy, which has the most empty announcements of all, because they mean absolutely nothing. There's nothing substantial. But when companies make big investments, they're not punished. Markets reward them. I'm not saying this makes markets long term, but when, when people are very quick to jump to the conclusion, markets are short term, I said, give me some evidence. Because I look at markets now, I think they're far too long term in my view. They're giving companies where things are way out in the future, too much value, not too little value which is creating a skewing in how we invest. So it's not that they're short term, it's maybe they're too long term. Maybe you're too focused on things that can happen in 10, 15, 20 years, not focused enough on what's happening now. And then of course people bring up 2008. So how can you trust markets after 2008? Hey, we know what happened in 2008, there was a complete meltdown. I was teaching this class in the fall of 2008, most difficult semester ever to teach a class like this. Because the world was melting down around you. You know what was most scary in the last quarter of 2008? I'll tell you my most scary moment. When, when G tried to raise, G at that time was a nice healthy company, not the walking dead company it is today, was trying to raise money with commercial paper. And people wouldn't buy commercial paper. You know what we learned in 2008? The scariest thing is a market with no liquidity. So when you complain about how volatile the market is, how much trading there's going on, get down and you say, thank you, God, for all this trading. Because if I remove that liquidity, you're going to find how much you miss markets. Isn't there a song like that? No, that's a country song. Never mind that. No, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. I don't. Same thing here. You're going to miss me when I'm gone as a market because that is what... And if you think about the culprits who created the 2008 crisis, this, the, the, the eye of the hurricane, it was, of course, financial service companies, banks. And if you think about the most regulated, most structured of all publicly traded companies, it's probably banks. So if you think regulation is going to make the next crisis go away, think again, because the companies you regulated to prevent the crisis were the ones who created the biggest crisis of the last 50 years. Let me at least do the final linkage. I'll set it up, and then we'll come back to it, because this, I think, is where the battle is being fought right now. I told you in the utopian world, there are no social costs, no social benefits, because I completely assume that we're away. The reality is, in the real world, decisions you make as a company create social costs and social benefits. And the question is, A, how do we bring them into decision making? And second, should we be bringing them? Maybe the, that second question should be asked first. I'll tell you the biggest challenge we're going to face, and we'll come back and address these. I, I, I don't want to sound like Donald Rumsfeld. You know, you have no idea who Donald Rumsfeld is. Take a look at his quotes. Yeah. But he'd say things, and he said, what did he say just now? But one of the things he said is, you cannot know the unknown. And I remember saying, what? But one of the problems with social costs, we assume good companies don't create them and bad companies do. But that's not really true, right? Sometimes you learn about costs after the fact. 20 years after you thought asbestos, remember when asbestos first came out, it was 
an amazing material to work with. You didn't have to carry these heavy things and you know, the people working in buildings said, this is amazing. Now, Manville at some point probably knew there was a problem, but for a while, I mean, you didn't realize there was a problem. What if tomorrow we find out and find, you know, we wake up and discover that smartphones make us stupid? It really makes your IQ drop. You can't go back and say, Apple, terrible company, you made my IQ drop, because they probably didn't know it when they first introduced it. So this notion that good companies don't create social costs and bad companies do, I don't think it's that simple. Sometimes you create social costs without even knowing it. The second is, social costs, unlike economic costs, are in the eyes of the beholder. Do you see what I mean by that? You take somebody who cares deeply about environmental things, you put them at a decision table, they're going to look at the environmental costs and that's going to be the biggest item. They're going to say, look, we can't do this. 